our first um, conferee this morning, the Kansas Department of Agriculture uh, regarding KAR 4-28-8, adoption of the Kansas Food Code. So with that, um, please introduce yourself and welcome to committee. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair and members of the committee. My name is Kate Langworthy and I serve as a staff attorney for the Kansas Department of Agriculture. Um, also present today on behalf of the department and available for questions is Amber Grissomore. She is our program manager for the, the Food Safety and Lodging Program. I'll be addressing proposed amendments to one regulation adopted for the administration of the department's Food Safety and Lodging Program, KAR 4-28-8 and the document adopted by reference in that regulation, the Kansas Food Code. These amendments are all proposed as a result of updates to the U.S. Food and Drug Administration's Model Food Code, which incorporate the most scientifically accurate food safety research into standards aimed at the promotion of public health and protection. Integrating these changes with consideration for the unique needs of Kansas retail food establishments will ensure that the Kansas program is aligned with the requirements of neighboring states and will also provide clarity for our licensees that are implementing these enhanced safety practices in their retail food establishments. This regulation is authorized by KSA 65-688, which sets out requirements for retail food establishments and necess necessitates KDA to set minimum standards for operating them. The pro proposed amendments were developed with the assistance of the Kansas Restaurant and Hospitality Association, which is composed of hospitality industry advocates and operators, and also with the input of the Kansas State Department of Education's Child Nutrition and Wellness Advisory Council. Our department also hosted a webinar for members of the public to ensure that the input of all stakeholders was considered, not just those affiliated with the involved organizations. Those entities and individuals that participated indicated that the proposed amendments would not result in additional costs being incurred for them. And now a public hearing regarding the proposed amendments is scheduled for April 17th, 2023, and notice of that hearing was published in the Kansas Register on February 9th. At this time, the department has received no public comments since publication of that notice. Now I will provide a brief summary of the substantive changes to KAR 4-28-8 in the Kansas Food Code and then stand for questions. Amendments to, the K to KAR 4-28-8 adopt by reference the current version of the Kansas Food Code, but accept the preface which provides non-regulatory information for operators. Amendments to Section 2-103.11 of the Kansas Food Code require the person in charge to use a verifiable method to inform employees of their duty to report diseases transmissible through food and also clarifies the supervisory role of the person in charge. Our amendments to section 3-301.11 of the Kansas Food Code specify that the prohibition of bare hand contact with ready-to-eat foods does not apply to handling ready-to-eat foods that are being added as an ingredient to a food that will be cooked fully in the food establishment. Our amendments to section 3-502.11 clarify that equivalent operating plans are only required for time slash temperature control for safety foods that are prepared under reduced oxygen packaging methods that do not control for the growth of and toxin formation by Clostridium botulinum and the growth of Listeria monocytogenes. Our amendments to section 3-502.12 specify an exemption from the current HACCP plan requirement for food that is always labeled with the product production time and date, is refrigerated at 41 degrees or less during storage, and is removed from packaging within the food establishment within 48 hours after that packaging. Our amendment to section 6-501.115 of the Kansas Food Code will allow dogs in exterior areas of premises provided certain requirements are met. Our amendment to section 7-203.11 
will prohibit food contact items from being stored in containers previously used with poisonous or toxic materials. And finally, our amendment to section 7-206.12 will be amended to match current pesticide laws that limit when rodent bait is required to be placed in tamper resistant bait stations. Again, thank you for the opportunity to appear today and I will now stand for questions. Thank you. Are the amendments that you just went through, are those what are going to be subject to um, public comment April 17th, 2023? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Committee, any questions? Representative Sutton. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is really just clarification. I'm looking at the 72-203.11. Uh, was that not already in statute? It was not. That is a new section. So, so food items could have been in containers that previously stored toxic materials. Under under the current food code, yes. the on, The only limitation was that food itself could not be stored in those containers, and so our inclusion of the additional reference to food contact items is something new. I'm certain that it's something that was being most likely being adhered to in our establishments. <laughs> I would certainly hope so, um, but we just wanted to make that perfectly clear for our licensees. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. And we're talking about food contact items, not food itself in that. The food okay. itself was already included. The amendment added the food contact items. Okay, great. And then regarding 6-501.115, um, allowing dogs in exterior areas of premises, provided certain requirements are met, is that in a different place that's in statute or is it just this regulation that i believe that is just in this regulation so it's entirely by rules and regs regarding where dogs are allowed in exterior areas of madam chair you'll find a bill that we got sent over to your side of the house just a just a few days ago well there we go yes, so <laughs> like, uh, at least a proposed law is on its way Yes, um, and we have a question from Representative Penn and then Senator Tyson. Fantastic. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for being here this morning. My question goes back to um, the regulation on 2-103-11. Okay, uh, the language that you have there, uh, we're talking about how it might be a little different, <clears throat> excuse me, than what we already have on the books or some bills that we've already passed, where it says in here, and I just want you to clarify for me, um, require the person in charge to inform employees in a verifiable manner, which I guess would mean that the em the employer or the boss would tell the employee in a way that can be verified that you've sent it and Correct. did yes. the handshake, right? Uh, of the requirements to report information about their health and their activities as they relate to diseases transmissible through food and to require the person in charge to ensure employees are routinely monitoring food temperatures during hot and cold holding. So the, the the latter portion of that I can understand. Where my uh, my challenge is is where you say requirements to report the information about their health and their activities. I thought that we did some health freedom bills where we weren't doing contact tracing or uh, COVID papers or things like that. Does this set us up to have that happening inside of your directorate? Uh, that for that kind of technical interpretation, I'll go ahead and defer to my program representative, Amber. My name is Amber Grissomore. Thank you for <clears throat> having me for questions today. So regarding that question, we would not require previously or otherwise for non-food related illnesses. So COVID wouldn't be considered in that at all. It would be things such as norovirus, which is a food transmittable disease, um, hep A, um, but those that, such as like Hep C or HIV, those types of things would not be included in this. Thank you, Madam. And Madam Chair, I appreciate you allowing me to ask that question because it is, uh, you know, personal privacy is very important to me. I have a little one at home right now who's going through it with a little stomach virus. So I understand where you're coming from with that. Uh, and we want to do public safety as well, but I also want to make sure that we maintain privacy as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, Senator Tyson and then Senator Fausto. Go ahead, Senator Tyson. Madam Chair, 
And thank you for the presentation. I, I have concern over the adoption of the federal standards. To me, that's that's a major change that isn't included in any of the handout. You have to actually go out and read the document. Um, there, there are several changes that could impact our packers and producers. Would you please speak to that? Absolutely, thank you. Um, when we are adopting the federal standard, that is more used as a guide. Um, and so through our outreach, we pare down the requirements um, and direct them to our Kansas industries. And so in as much as those changes would affect them, our, our local and state stakeholders were involved in that process. And so they are being considered um, the the adoption of the federal standard is almost outreach upon outreach and so um, there is the conference for food protection which is a national organization that meets every two years and is composed of industry regulators academia and consumers they discuss at those meetings issues for consideration which are then forwarded to um, the fda and considered when updating the model food code and then, as I touched on in my presentation, we completed our own local outreach when crafting our own document, the Kansas Food Code, to assure that we weren't just doing a blanket adoption of federal standards without any consideration for our state. Okay. Um, may I, Madam Chairman, follow up? Sure, go ahead. Thank you. Well, I, I'm going through these and I have a feeling you didn't talk to all the processing plants, small processing plants. They didn't weigh in on some of this stuff. And I know that we've, if you look at the history over the years, um, in order to capture federal money, we have restricted them through rules and regs and statute um, to the point of where common sense is. I mean, you, you just were asked about the hazardous Seriously, there's not any um, anyone that's going to put food in hazardous container. And the fact that we are trying to put that in language is just disturbing to me because you're never going to get ahead of it all. Um, well, if you look at the new rules and or the new code, it says business in it. Business means operations controlled by one person. That. That doesn't seem accurate to me, one person. And we're asking the state to adopt that language. Is that correct? Um, just as a point of clarification, do you mind telling me the, the page number that you're looking at so I can more effectively answer your question? Absolutely, it was page two. It was quick into the document. And if you continue through the document, there's um, other items too, but I, I won't go over each of those. That's just a good example. Um, another example is why isn't milk defined when everything else is, but thank you. Hey, did you have a, an answer or um, comment? I am happy to look into that. Um, and as far as whether um, the business entity meaning operations controlled by one person um, was me meant to include that or whether it was uh, just to, to make sure that we were encapsulating food establishments as they stand. And then I can get back to the committee on that if that would be desired. Thank you. That would. Thank that would, you. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. And it does say fluid milk in the document, but they defined eggs as should be, but milk is fluid milk, but then it doesn't say what, what milk is. Um, I, I just have concern when we adopt I know these new codes, it's standard um, and there's money, we're chasing money. In fact, uh, that would be my question, Madam Chairman, how much funds are going with this by upgrading this code? And thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, is that an answer that is gonna have to be reported later to the committee? Yes, I will have to check into that and get back to the committee. Thank you very much for that opportunity. Madam Thank you. Can and I just ask a question? I'm sorry. 
Um, sure, I didn't see your hand raised. Just a moment. Okay, I, wanted I didn't. To I apologize. I'm sorry. I just wanted to follow up on Senator Tyson's um, question and comment that we heard regarding Kansas industries and stakeholders that were consulted in um, proposing these rules and regulations. You had mentioned earlier the Kansas Restaurant and Hospitality Association. Could you tell us the other industry associations and other stakeholders that were consulted and conferred with um, in proposing these new rules and regulations? Um, that is the primary organization that we worked with. Um, the, the remainder of the outreach was completed through the webinar um, where individuals, not necessarily as a representative of those organizations, participated. But I'm happy to look in and see where we, where we received input from as far as um, stakeholder organizations. That would be great. And then we did have uh, Senator Faust Godot waiting to ask a question and then the chairman. So, uh, Senator Faust Godot. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, Ma'am, in regards to your, you, you, the container and the um, the other area, uh, the contaminated area. So, what is your definition of the contaminated area, and? Um, your code or your reg that you're dealing with here today, uh, which one does it pertain to? Um, for that, I will go ahead again defer to Amber as far as technical information. Thank you for the question. I also wanted to make a make sure you introduce yourself again thank you i'm sorry thank you my name is amber grissmore i'm the food safety and lodging program manager at the kansas department of agriculture um thank you for the question um regarding 7203.11 this was actually while it is now um related to poisonous or toxic material on both food contact services and non-food contact services. This was addressed in two areas previously where beforehand it could have been cited as two separate violations. And now with the proposed changes would only be one violation. And Madam Chair, if I may, what's your definition of the contaminated area? Can you elaborate on that question? So are you, the contaminated area, is it where the container where the food is stored or, or the place where the container is stored? Okay, so related to that, it would be the, it could be the food contact surface that the container could contaminate. It could be the container itself. If it wasn't able to actually contaminate the area or another item that was close by, then it would not be cited. Okay. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Thank you for that explanation. Thank you. And then next we had questions from Chairwoman Wassinger and then Representative Thank Carmichael. You. Thank you, Mr. Ch Madam Chair. I have two questions. One, I only see the Secretary of State's stamp on these ro proposed rules and regs. And then number two, uh, I'd like, I would like when anyone brings something to the committee that instead of giving us three lines, we change this, we change this in KSA, I think they should quote, the, uh, give us the exact KSA references within their packet. But I would like to know why they don't have any other stamps. Go ahead. Absolutely. Um, the regulation is the the item that is required to be stamped. Um, and we do have a copy where it's stamped by the Department of Administration on October 26th and then stamped by the Attorney General's office um, on January 3rd. Um, we have not yet completed the public hearing. Um, once that is completed, that is when um, the Secretary of State would then publish. 
Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And today is a day when I am in committee without a, um, a laptop or other computer, and I would find it helpful, um, especially when um, the rules and reg is uh, talking about authorized by and implementing a, a statute and a couple of statutes there it would be helpful to have that in the packet as well, just for committee's ease of reference. Um, with that then, um, questions from Representative Carmichael. I would actually like to uh, express a different view of these regulations. Um, my food handler's card is now expired, so I'm no longer an expert, but I remember when the state contracted with Sedgwick County to do the inspections in my town, and I was concerned that Department of Agriculture being in Topeka, that the quality of those uh, inspections might decline. And I'm happy to say, at least from my perspective, that I'm extremely pleased with what the Department of Agriculture has done by way of food safety inspections, certainly in my county. And I do recognize that some of my colleagues uh, believe that no one would put food utensils in something that had been used uh, to store toxins or pesticides. But I read the reports every week in the newspaper, and I am absolutely amazed at what some restaurants do, uh, things that are just very clearly unsafe and unsanitary still happen. And I think if we didn't have the Department of Agriculture being proactive in their regulations and proactive in their inspections, I think we would have a proliferation of foodborne illnesses, certainly in my town, based upon the multiple violations that we routinely see every week at certain restaurants in my town. And, you know, we want to have a level playing field for all Kansas businesses. And I think it's appropriate uh, for businesses, frankly, to incur the additional expense to make sure that our food is safe to eat. And I think if we didn't have this type of a regulatory environment, there would be people who cut corners and as a result, people would get sick. So I just want to compliment uh, the Department of Agriculture on its work and on these regulations. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Question from Representative Penn. Thank you, Madam Chair. And following up on my colleague's uh, uh, comments right there, Madam, can you maybe give us an idea perhaps of how much uh, extra expense the increased regulation, uh, regulatory environment, to use his words, would incur either for the state or for businesses? Thank you. Certainly. While I can't provide a hard number, um, a vast majority of these changes for just further clarify the existing standards or provide exceptions to them that consider the normal business practices of a food establishment. And so our expectation is that there will be no additional cost. And, and do you have enough personnel, I would imagine, uh, and I'm in the same area as my previous colleague speaking, uh, do you have enough personnel to get out there and actually enforce said regulations, either as, as they, they exist now or with the increase? I, I know there were labor shortages and everything. I just want to understand that a little bit better. Again, I will defer to our program manager on that information. Hello, my name is Amber Grissmore. I'm the Food Safety and Lighting Pro Food Safety and Lodging Program Manager for the Kansas Department of Agriculture. And thank you, and I welcome that question. Yes, I, we do have the staff in order to conduct um, these requirements. And I'm happy to say that our turnover has actually decreased pretty significantly in the last year and a half since, since I started. So I, I feel pretty good about us being able us being able to do that. And as far as the question regarding mm -hmm. um, economic impact, um, there's actually a couple of areas where I could actually see an economic decrease for our license holders. To, to follow up on a couple of questions, one of the implementing statutes, KSA 65688, states in order to reimburse the state of Kansas for inspections by the Secretary of Food Establishment 
plants, food establishments and food processing plants. The secretary shall adopt rules and regulations um, establishing a graduated application and license fee schedule. Um, and also the secretary shall adopt rules and regulations necessary to carry out the provisions of this section, including establishing minimum conditions necessary to operate and maintain a food establishment or food processing plant in a safe and sanitary manner. So um, I appreciate the um, just a little bit of explanation about why we're here and, and the impetus for these rules and regulations. And I do see that Representative Carmichael has another question. Representative? I apologize. I forgot to put my hand down. I'll try again. Thank you. <laughs> okay. And that may be the same case uh, with Senator Fauscado and Senator Tyson, who still have their hands up. Uh, do we have further questions from them? I do. That was yes. a no from... Okay, go ahead, Madam Senator Chairman. Tyson. Uh -huh. Yes, and in, in fact, I'd like to comment to a couple of items that the committee may not be aware of. Um, I think it was 2011, 2012, the um, legislature, and I, I did not support it, said that we would be greater than or equal to federal state inspections for meat processing plants. Greater or equal to with our state inspection inspection program. So I've asked this question, why do we need a state inspection program then? If we're greater than or equal to the federal, and then we have the custom level that is below the state inspection, why do we even have a state inspection program then? And and I'm, so you you may think that these rules and these regulations are simple changes. But over the years, we've adopted so many regulations that I know a couple of the plants have gone custom so that they, because they not, cannot reach those standards. And some of them are just um, not even, and I tried to find history where there was a foodborne illness from any of these small processing plants in Kansas ever. And we cannot find any history on it, but we, have increased their inspection standards to gain federal money. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Were those comments or a, a question to be answered today? If the uh, department would love to comment or like to comment on it, that would be great, but I would understand if they don't. Sure, thank you. Would you like to comment? Um, only as a point of clarity that um, our meat and poultry inspection program is separate from our food safety and lodging program, which is adopting these standards um, currently. Um, and so I am happy to, um, to take those comments back to our meat and poultry program. Um, and we will certainly consider those as well. Madam Chair, m let me be clear. That is an example of what we, and I, I don't know what we're doing to our um, restaurants and stuff here with the obligation. Understand we want these inspections and we want, but we also don't want to the extent that we're putting them out of business. And if there is foodborne illnesses and issues, then I get it. But um, some of these are, like I said, the contaminated, I don't know anybody that's going to do that. I'm sorry that Representative Carmichael does, but um, I can't imagine somebody that would intentionally harm. But thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, committee. Other questions? Seeing none. Yes, then. Madam Chair, my hand is up again. Oh, I'm sorry, Representative Carmichael, go ahead. Thank you. I can't imagine anybody that would intentionally do it either. But the fact of the matter is, it happens with great regularity in my community and being someone who has contracted a foodborne illness uh, on more than one occasion, uh, I think it's important that we have safe meat and safe food and clean beds to sleep in and hotels and motels. And that is a cost of doing business in those businesses. And I seriously doubt that any of my constituents would want it otherwise. Thank you. Thank you, committee. Any further questions? Seeing none, then Thank you for appearing and your testimony today in committee. I appreciate it. 
And with that, then we'll close the hearing on the Kansas Department of Agriculture, KAR 4-28-8. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next, we will open the hearing on the Kansas State Board of Healing Arts and KAR 100-15-1 expiration dates. And I assume we're not talking about expiration dates of food um, since uh, we're in the State Board of Healing Arts, having just left the Department of Agriculture regulation. Please introduce yourself and welcome to committee. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Vice Chair and Honorable Committee members. My name is Cody Bebout. I'm the Assistant General Counsel of the Kansas State Board of Healing Arts, and I'm here today for your consideration and comment of proposed amendment to Regulation KR 100-15-1, and no, we're not talking about food. For some quick context, the KSBHA, or the board, licenses and regulates 16 different healthcare professions in Kansas, and we have about uh, 33,000 licensees. I think it's just a, a shade under that. One of our license types is resident active license. A resident active license allows a physician in residency to moonlight if they meet a number of qual qualifications. And so before you for your consideration is a simple amendment to 115.1, which establishes the expiration date for the resident active license as June 30th of each year. And that's all this amendment changes. So it's pretty straightforward. Uh, with that, I'm willing to stand for questions. Thank you. You mentioned that this amendment would apply to physicians in residency would allow them to moonlight. What do you mean by that? Please first explain what a physician in residency is. And I assume it's a medical student um, in residency practice. But if you'll explain your comment, that would be appreciated. Sure thing. So residency is post-grad work. Um, so you're a doctor, but then you have to do a residency Generally, that is not generally, sorry, that's 36 months. Now, what a, a resident active license does um, is allows you have to meet certain qualifications, which I can get into in just a second. But basically to have a second job if you wanted more hours, more experience, that kind of thing. Um, so for a resident active license, a second job as a physician. not Yes, a yes. I'm sorry. Job. Yes. If they wanted to do more postgrad training. And just their residency work. That's correct. Yes. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you Appreciate for that. And it is if it expires June thirtieth of each year, then they have to renew it each year. Yes, assuming they would renew it. We we kind of renew it. Right. Uh, if it's on the tail end of their residency, they probably wouldn't renew it because they would just become a uh, full, you know, pursue a full active license or whatever other license might apply to their situation. Yes. Thank you. Committee. Other questions. Okay, seeing no questions then, thank you for your testimony. Thank you for appearing in committee today. Appreciate that. And we will close the hearing on the Kansas State Board of Healing Arts, KR 100-15-1. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we will open the hearing on Kansas Department of Health and Environment, Division of Healthcare Finance, regarding KAR 129-6-88, Disabled Individuals with Earned Income, determined eligibles. Please introduce yourself and welcome to committee. Thank you, Senator Warren and members of the committee, both here and, and virtually. My name is Brian Boscus. I'm general counsel for the Kansas Department of Health and Environment. What is being presented to the committee, and I will have an expert talk about it, not me. Uh, that will be Christine Osterlin, who is director of operations, and she'll come after me. Uh, there are a couple of, of um, bookkeeping or uh, things that I did want to make mention of. This uh, regulation, the notice for public hearing was published yesterday in the Federal Register. Uh, the public hearing will be on May 17th uh, at approximately nine o'clock. Um, that notice is out there right now and, and hopefully we will have a good participation. What this regulation deals with in the Medicaid program are people who are considered disabled by the Social Security Administration, but who still want to work. Um, Oftentimes, those are individuals who are in part-time work and, and can't get health coverage otherwise. And this is a way for them to have Medicaid coverage in return for paying a, a, a premium. Christine will go into a little bit more detail, but so that the testimony that is before the committee is, is absolutely accurate, if you would turn to the second page, and specifically in par the second paragraph, third paragraph, 
and the next last uh, uh, next to the last paragraph where it says 250 percent that percent amount should be 226 percent and Christine will explain why we picked that particular number but uh, the regulation does use 226 instead of 250 percent uh, with that um, Madam Chair, I will turn this over to Christine. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Um, my name is Christine Osterland. I'm the Director of Operations and the Deputy Me Medicaid Director for the Kansas Department of Health and Environment Division of Healthcare Finance. Um, I'm going to give you some background and a little bit of explanation on uh, the proposed amendment to KAR. Uh, 129-6.88. Um, as Brian mentioned, this is a pro proposed change to our Working Healthy program. Um, a little back background about Working Healthy. Uh, working Healthy has been a part of the Medicaid program since 2002, so it is a longstanding program. It serves um, individuals with disabilities um, ages 16 to 65 um, who are still working but have an income that is less than 300% of the federal poverty level. Um, working healthy participants, most of them are charged a premium. If you are at 100% of the federal poverty level with your income, then you would be charged a monthly premium. And that premium ranges from $50 up to $152 uh, for a single person household. So to explain the proposed amendment, I have to also give a little bit of background on some home and community-based waivers, because um, these programs um, do kind of intersect and serve some of the same populations. So in Kansas, um, two of our home and community-based waiver, one is called the Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities Waiver, also referred to as the IDD waiver. And we also have the Physical Disabilities Waiver, or called the PD waiver. Um, these programs uh, focus on populations age 18 to 65 years of age. So in 2021, the Kansas legislature voted to increase the what's called the protected income level for the home and community-based waivers, which of course would have also included the IDD and the PDD waiver. And what that did is um, it what happens in these waivers of protected income level is it's a amount of your income that is withheld from the from consideration of the amount that you can pay towards medical bills. So it's kind of like income that the individual would get to kind of keep for themselves, um, kind of in layman's terms to describe that, which, of course, was a big win for families. And, and I know they very much appreciate the actions of the legislature. How that intersects with the Working Healthy program is now, if I am at 300% of Social Security income and I'm on an IDD or the PD waiver, I get my coverage and I don't have to pay a premium. If I'm on the Working Healthy program because I choose that I would like to work and stay active in the community, I have to pay a premium. So we've almost disincentivized our disabled populations from wanting to work. And so what this proposed amendment um, to the regulation is what we're trying to do is kind of even that playing field a little bit to make work still an attractive option for our Medicaid members. The other reason that this is important is I think some of you may be aware if you were if you deal with any of the uh, health care committees is many of our waivers have a waiting list. And so if we're incentivizing folks to go to the waivers, a lot of times that puts additional pressure on applications as well as waiting list. And just to give you some recent statistics, February of 2023. For the IDD waiver, currently there were 4,804 individuals waiting to, to receive services. And for the PD waiver, that number was 2,454 individuals. So again, we don't really want to encourage folks to want to go the waivers and rather encourage them to want to work and stay active and, and be a part of the Working Healthy program. So after that PIL increase was done, we've looked at several ways to try to even that playing field a little bit and, and incentivize our folks that want to work to remain working. And what we came up with is that what we need to do is raise the threshold at which you would have to pay a premium in the Working Healthy program. So right now in the Working Healthy program, if you're at 100% of the federal poverty level, which is about $1,215 a month for your income, you're going to have to pay a premium 
to be a part of the Working Healthy Program. We want to raise that to 226% of the federal poverty level, which is about $3,038 a month that they could earn and before they would have to start paying a premium to be a part of the Working Healthy Program. So if adopted, um, this, this regulation would mean that Kansas would collect roughly $245,000 annually less in premiums um, than we do today. Um, and the associated cost would be captured during the human um, services caseload process. But we believe the cost is necessary to avoid adding additional pressure to the home and community-based waivers um, and also to continue to incentivize our individuals with disabilities. And there's about 900 of them currently to continue to incentivize them to work and, and remain in their communities. Um, and if the committee has any questions on the proposed regulation, I'm happy to answer them or also brought with me uh, Liz Long, who is our program director over Working Healthy, um, who can answer a lot of the technical questions. Thank you. Committee questions. Yes, Madam Chair, I have questions. Yes, Representative Carmichael, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, a question for Mr. Vaucus, please. I think during your introductory remarks, maybe I misheard what you said or maybe you misspoke, but I thought I heard you say that these regulations had been post or had been published yesterday in the federal register. And I would assume that it was published in the online version of the Kansas State Register. Is that correct? Absolutely, uh, Representative Carmichael. That was my misspeak. It is the Kansas Register that it was published in. I thought that was the case. I just want to make sure we were clear. Thank you. Senator Faust-Gadeau. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Madam Vice Chair. Um, and this question is for either conferee. Uh, what are the allowed hours per week that uh, a disabled individual is able to work in order to receive, um, continue with the benefits? I will let Liz, our program director, answer that question. Hi, I'm Liz Long and I'm with KBHE and um, director of the Working Healthy Program. There isn't a set number of hours, it's based on income. So a person could be, be self-employed or be working a part-time position. You know, they may be getting $10 an hour, they may be getting $15 an hour. It's strictly based on, on what you make. I see. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Senator Francisco. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. So I um, appreciate the testimony and I appreciate the intent to um, make sure that we have this program for people um, to feel that they can continue to work. So you talked about 226%. And I, when I'm reading this, um, the change would be at least 226%, but not greater than 300%? Um, yeah, so yes, so we would start charging premiums at 226%, but yes, the, the income threshold to be able to participate in the program would remain the same. We're not changing that, correct. So it would be a much smaller number of folks. They would be between that 226 and, and the 300% that would pay premiums. Thank you. What do you mean by a smaller percent, a smaller number of people who would be eligible and would be paying premiums? Not eligible. So the eligibility for the program remains unchanged. And that's um, at, what's that? 300% of the federal poverty level. And what number is that dollar wise? We actually, I think we brought that with us. Did we, Liz? Well, we've got $3,038 per month for 226%. So 300 is... Yes. Yes. So it was currently today, um, they if you make more than a little over $1,000 a month, you pay a premium. And of course, $1,252, you would start being charged a premium if that was your income. We're going to increase it. So you'd have to make $3,038 a year um, before month. you'd have a month, sorry, before you'd have to start paying a premium. So we're actually increasing the number of Kansans who would be eligible 
for Medicaid without paying a premium? No. We're, have I said that correctly or not? Because if we're taking the at least from 100% of the federal poverty level income guidelines to 226% who are eligible to participate without paying a premium, it sounds like we're expanding Medicaid eligibility um, without having to pay a premium. Or tell me how I have misstated that. Um, uh, Brian Bosk, again, General Counsel for KDHE. The issue is, is the people who are eligible for this are really remaining the same. If you earn less than 300% federal poverty level and are working, uh, then you could apply for, and are considered disabled by Social Security, you could apply. What is being changed is the floor at which a premium is being imposed. So instead of the 100% of poverty, which as Christine said, is about 1200 a month, it now moves up to a little bit over 3000 a month before you have to pay a premium. The group that is eligible for this program remains the same. What changes is the group that would have to pay a premium and that does collapse. Part of the issue here is, is with the protected income level change for the HCBS program, quite frankly, you could earn, you could be at 200% of poverty, be disabled, you would have paid a premium under current regulations to working healthy, but if you could move to the physically disabled waiver, you'd get the same coverage, keep the same income, and not have to pay a premium. With some of the waiting lists that we have, that unfortunately not only disincentivizes, why'd you use that word? Boy, that's a long one. Um, you know, working healthy program, but puts unnecessary pressures on, on the HCBS programs. That's part of it, uh, the main reason. The same people are still going to be eligible. Uh, um, uh, it's not uh, an increase. Um, it, they, some of them may move over into the physically disabled or the IDD waiver, depending upon what they can qualify. Uh, to, to be fair, and, and I'm sure the chair is aware of this, Medicaid has been described as, as a Byzantine um, architecture at times. And this is unfortunately maybe an example of that where we're trying to balance two different programs that unfortunately intersect. Who pays the difference then um, between the 100% and the 226% that those premiums aren't being collected anymore? Where does that money, what happens is, what happens? Yeah. Um, what happens is, is quite frankly, the agency would not be able to collect those premiums and there would be a loss of premiums that uh, the agency would no longer be able to collect. And I think it's mentioned in the testimony. Uh, the, the issue is, is that if, however, the person is moving to a PD or an IID way or IDD waiver, those services are usually more expensive. And, and so you run into an issue that even though it looks as if we're losing 700,000, about 700,000, but, but if the person moves to a higher costing program we ended up actually losing more. And, and so to be fair, that was a concern uh, for the agency, but if we did nothing, the people would move, we'd probably lose the premiums anyway. So, so uh, to be fair, it's a balancing that, that I'm not too sure that there was a good answer to, but this is what the agency has proposed uh, for this regulation. Sorry to make this probably more complicated and, and maybe I'm not explaining it well. I'll have another question, then I'll let someone else ask a question. You said that um, the legislature passed in 2021 a piece of legislation that would increase the protected income level. That's right. Tell me about that bill number, if we could have um, research pull that up, and what exactly did the legislature authorize? I would need to pull the exact bill number, but if I remember right, it was actually a proviso in the appropriations bill for the two prior years before that. Uh, and, and then there was a regulation that the KDHE passed to, to basically implement the proviso. Uh, and that was where it came out to be $1,172 or, or, or something like that. But I'd be glad to provide that information back uh, to the committee. Yes, I'd like to see where the legislature voted to increase the um, level of income to 226% from 100%, because that's well, and, more than and, doubling. And again, it's um, 
we can maybe bless a, 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 what, what's happened is is what the legislature did was tie the protected income level for the HCBS program to the income level for the Supplemental Security Income Program, or SSI, which is a separate federal program, but then, uh, and it's on a different standard, and, and that was actually what was increased. But when you take what is 300% of SSI and push it over to what is the protect, uh, poverty income level, 300% of SSI becomes roughly 75% of 300% of, of, of poverty. And, and, and unfortunately, it's, it's, it was a way to make sure that, you know, we still allowed for the PIL, but if people were above that 300%, they would have to pay a premium and they would still, you know, be involved. But it would allow people who were looking at the HCBS programs to still remain in the Working Healthy program if they could. I'm going to move on and maybe come back to some of my questions later, but Representative Sutton and then Chair Wassinger. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, really, you kind of you kind of uh, uh, stepped into where I was I was going to go with the fiscal note on such legislation, and that's really what I'm seeing here. I don't see this as a rule and reg. I see this as a pretty profound change to th the existing policies that might I you know when when, when we're looking at cost avoidance and a fiscal note and changes to the to the waivers or or the waiver lists anyway that's really something i think we probably need some more eyes on and and so i would probably recommend uh this particular change to to go through the legislative process i i'd like to see a, a committee look into this a whole lot more thoroughly than the four of us sitting here at a table. I agree with that. Uh, Chair Wassinger. I agree with that as well. Uh, when you say you're going to lose close to a million dollars, KDHE isn't really losing it. It's the state of Kansas and it's the taxpayers. Would that be correct? It, if if I understand the question, it's on the uh, loss of premiums, and yes, that would be a loss of uh, pro income to the program. Um, it would be. I'm trying to remember what the exact federal share would be on that, but yes, it would be a loss of income to the program. Okay, I have I have a real problem with it, and I agree with Representative Sutton that it needs to go through legislation. I don't have any. Uh, Palms about saying, I, I bet you won't do that, but I think it'll come to legislation when we get back into session next week. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> also, to follow up on Representative Sutton's comment regarding uh, the legislature should have eyes on this, in the regulation in subsection C, the proposed change is to talk about for each individual whose monthly applicable income is 226%, the department has added, we would now in this proposed rule and regulation be looking at guideline income levels for applicable family size based on the official federal poverty level income indicated for the applicable family size. And to me, adding, looking at family size, when currently in law, we have each individual, is that a policy change or um, why the difference in what the poverty level of income we're going to be looking at? As I understand it, and I defer to either Chris or Liz to, to correct me if I'm wrong, but the Working Healthy Program has always used household income. Um, and, and so I, I think Maybe that was added to, to make it a little bit clearer, but the Working Healthy Program is usually used household income. So it could be a household of one. It could be a household of four. It would still be uh, the 300% of poverty. And, and to be fair, that's why percentages are sometimes used instead of using a specific dollar number, because it makes it a little bit easier. It makes it a little bit more evergreen 
than, than using a, 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 an evergreen by meaning that you'd have to change it continuously if you used a specific dollar number. Representative Penn. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you uh, to all the previous reps uh, that kind of took the wind out my sails. But let me put it to you like this. I, I, I know that you're coming from a great place. And first of all, let me thank you for coming here to testify today. You did a miraculous job. Uh, this is a little confusing for those of us who haven't uh, been in this space uh, and as immersed, as immersed as you are. Uh, however, comma, uh, when I look at this, I, I, I look at the piece that you set up here on the economic impact, and you're going to stand to lose, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars on balance. And I think Chair Wasinger was asking, uh, is that from KDHE or is that the state of Kansas? Okay. So one thing that I've learned in politics is the what's in it for me-ism, right? Because if there was no self-interest, there would be no interest at all. And I can't for the life of me understand how it is that you would just go lose money. So I'm, now I have to investigate what is it that you're after what's in it for you. And what I see this as is a, a backdoor expansion on a smaller population for Medicaid expansion. Yeah. And, I, and I, can, I can understand that. I think we can all see that. My consternation is what legislative approval do you have to do it? Who have you worked with in the legislature in any of the relevant committees on either the Senate or the House side uh, to make this big of a change? Because I firmly believe by the Constitution, the power of the purse to do something like this belongs solely with the legislature. So I look forward to this coming back to us and handling it and us partnering with you to get it done the right way. Thank you. I'd appreciate that. I'll be glad to take all of these comments back to uh, the uh, agency and have it looked at. I do, if I remember right, I believe uh, Medicaid Director Sarah Fertig has presented on this topic, though, to the, uh, to the Bethel Committee. Uh, I'm not sure if it's been presented to the other health uh, committees, though, of either house. I'm sorry, say that again. Was there a legislative committee that has authority to um, act on bills and legislation that this has been heard on or is Bob yes. Bethel committee? Uh, I, I just know that this particular topic and this concern has been presented to the Bob Bethel um, committee. The joint committee on, I forget the exact full name of it, but it's uh, I, I usually refer to it as the Bethel committee. Sure, which would be different than a... Um, a committee who hears bills and uh, passes them favorably or unfavorably out of committee. And, uh, and, and to be fair, I don't know if if either um, um, Director Furtick or Christine or somebody has presented to either of the uh, health committees on so either the House or, or the Senate. Thank you. Senator Faust Godot has a question. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam v Vice Chair. Uh, Brian, uh, did I understand you to say that this would only be allowed for those people with uh, disabilities that have already been approved eligible for the services. And then uh, could you please elaborate again on your statement of if we don't do this, those individuals would lose the benefits anyway. And could you elaborate a little more? Yes, uh, let me try. And if I said or, or implied that they would lose benefits, that, that is not the intent. Um, what is, is if we start with a population group that are in under 300% of poverty in income uh, for themselves or for their household, if those individuals are considered disabled by Social Security, they have a variety of ways to apply and receive Medicaid. One of them is the Working Healthy Program which allows them to not only still receive, be considered disabled, but have income and work in the community. Um, we normally would charge premiums for that and under, the, and under the current system, we start charging premiums at 100% of poverty, but it goes up to 300%. If that person is disabled and has more than 300% of poverty, they're not eligible for the Working Healthy Program. So we're just, no longer that's not available to them, something else might be. What happened in the last several years with the increase in the protected income level for the HCBS program, which was both a, a provision that came out of a proviso and then eventually implemented through a regulation, was that a person who normally fits the population that could use working healthy 
could also now apply for an HCBS program and still retain the income up to, and this is where it gets confusing, 300% of SSI. And, and, and so when I say 300%, there's actually two standards being applied. But the comparison is, is 300% of SSI is roughly 75% of 300% poverty. That's actually what drives the 226% number that's implemented in this regulation. So it's not people losing eligibility, but they might have a financial advantage under the way the system is now current to move into an HCBS program and not have to pay a premium and still get the same benefits and maybe even some more. But that also has the unintended consequence of probably putting pressure on the HCBS programs where there are waiting lists. I see. And, and, and Madam Vice Chair, so, so Bryant, you're saying you're not allowing new people to come in. You're only still dealing with the original eligible uh, disabled individuals, just giving, helping those Kansans out a little more. Is that yes. correct? Yes, and, and but I will be more than happy to take back the committee's concerns that this may be a, a backdoor way to increase Medicaid populations as well. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Thank you, and thank you for taking those comments back as well, and for the explanation of how working healthy um, assists Kansans and appreciate um, how we have that in place. We have a couple of questions. Uh, we're just going to take them in order. First, from Senator Francisco. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. I really have a comment because um, I remember the changes and all the phone calls when we talked about the um, protected income level. So what was happening is the people were on home and community-based services. They were using all of their Social Security income um, to pay for that service level. And, and none of it was allowed to be kept by the family, um, either um, for um, special needs or other, you know, a trip um, to, on a taxi to the doctor instead of, you know, another way. So it was people who were really struggling to be able to um, have some funds out of their social security payments that they could use on their own expenses. So I think the legislature, or many, a majority of the legislature seem to have heard that and made that change in protected income. So, and, and I remember the discussions because that was a vote um, in our budget bills several times when we did that. So here we are seeing that change affect another program that only is in rules and regs. So if, I think if um, this Working Healthy program had those requirements in the statute, it would have easily been a bill. Um, I understand that um, there's some interest in hearing this as a bill, but I, I just wanna say I appreciate um, the agency looking at um, two sides of a very different picture and trying to come up with a way that rewards people for continuing to work, which is what I think. I think you're healthier if you are um, working. And if, if you're looking at your income and saying, I'm still struggling and I'm going to end up getting more if I stop working, um, I see that as a loss um, for Kansans and um, Kansas families. Thank you, Representative Carmichael. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. First, I wanna echo and agree with Senator Francisco's remarks, and it is very important that we encourage people to work, not encourage people to quit working so that they can take advantage of benefits. And I think that is in fact, a large part of the purpose here. I, I do recognize my colleagues' concern that this might be beyond legislative authorization. 
First, I think the agency's counsel makes it clear that there is, in fact, such authorization, and Senator Francisco's recollections uh, only reaffirm that belief on my part. But perhaps more importantly, I note that the regulation itself bears the approval of the Attorney General dated December 1 of uh, 2022, and of course that was Attorney General Derek Schmidt at the time. And I hearken back to a discussion we had about a year ago on some Department of Labor regulations that were presented to us where the Attorney General's office assured us that they were very diligent in complying with the law before they apply their approval stamp to regulations and specifically the law required first that there be legislative authorization for the regulation, second that the regulation not be contrary to existing law, and third, that there not be case law decisions uh, that would contravene uh, the regulation. And I know with Senator Clay's now working for Attorney General Kobach, uh, that Attorney General Kobach no doubt will continue to be very diligent to make sure that when agencies bring us regulations, it's within the statutory authorization. And as it relates to this regulation, I take Attorney General Schmidt at his word and agree with his conclusion. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative. Um, I want to echo uh, the concerns of the committee that have been stated here uh, about whether this goes beyond the uh, authority of the um, agency to uh, enact this type of regulation without legislation. Representative Penn. Thank you, Madam Chair. And and again, I definitely echo uh, the heart of Senator Francisco uh, to you all. This, this is a massive work. And thank you for re-explaining it again, sir. And I was a little more clearer than mud, so I appreciate that. Uh, but I, I just want to reiterate it exactly as the chair said, that it is not in the purview, nor is it in the, po in the power, I would say, of the executive branch or a director thereof to either obligate funds or to set the legislature on a path that we have to do that or to back us into a position where that is something that occurs. So in the spirit of working well and healthy, because what you're trying to do is, is, is uh, good, uh, I would say very strongly, let's bring this back to the legislature uh, through the appropriations uh, process so that everything can be uh, scrutinized appropriately and set out because as much as my esteemed colleague bring, brings up uh, A.G. Schmidt, an AG opine does not the Constitution make. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Sutton. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and I'm just kind of taking a second bite of the apple and saying exactly the same thing. But if it was construed that I'm uh, in some way opposed to this measure, that would be incorrect. Um, when we passed the the uh, uh, the increase to 300%. I was in favor of that then, and I'm in favor of this as well. I just want to make sure we go through the correct avenue in order to get it done. And, uh, and because of the fiscal uh, impact, uh, I, I truly believe that this is a legislative issue that needs to be handled legislatively. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. I want to also clarify that uh, the program serves a good purpose, and it is important that uh, people who have the ability to do so are able to work, and we wouldn't want to disincentivize that. Uh, but we do need to go through the proper legislative process if that's what's required to make sure that um, our government is uh, functioning as it's intended. Any other questions or comments? Senator Francisco. Thank you, uh, Madam Vice Chair. I'm trying to understand um, how we had already given them the authority in the rules and regulations to set a percentage um, based on federal poverty income guidelines and then are saying that can't be changed except through statute. So somehow um, at, at some time, the legislature would have seen and it seen this regulation, allowed it to stand, and it in fact does um, in some ways set a bar for what um, expenditures are going to be made. So I'm, I'm trying to understand 
if, if that was allowed to happen in regs and there's a change, how is that not part of that process? I'm not sure I have a good answer. I, 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 I was part of the team that actually helped write the, um, all of the regulations that were moved originally from what were an SRS set of regulations in, in the KAR 30-6s to the 129-6s uh, back in 2013. And, and to be fair, some of those percentages were there. Um, we, we basically used the same statutory authorization uh, then, um, and, and it's noted in, in, in the regulations and I won't repeat them, but it's, it's the sort of thing that regardless I, I will take back the, the comments from, from both sides on this issue uh, because I think it is an important issue. And, and, and to be fair, it, it's, I don't think anybody is challenging the legislatures or the agency's intent in this. Uh, the I too would want to make sure that we do it in a correct way. I appreciate that. Thank you. Committee, other questions or comments? Seeing none, then thank you very much for the work you've done on this and the very thorough explanation. And there are questions and concerns. We just want to make sure that, um, you know, we're proceeding in a proper way. And uh, I think the agency does, too. So appreciate the work that you do on behalf of Kansans and this population of Kansans as well. So thank you both for appearing in committee today and your testimony and your, your answers to the questions. Appreciate it. And yes, Senator Francisco. Thank you, um, Madam Vice Chair. I'd just like to add my thanks because I think if the best way to do it is through statute, they have given us a good start um, to writing that. Right, that's right. If it needs to come to statute, then we've got uh, some good background to start with. So thank you very much and appreciate the uh, robust discussion on it as well. Committee, we will um, then close the hearing on the uh, KDHE uh, Division of Healthcare Finance and KR 129-6-88. And uh, we will now turn to committee discussion and comments on the proposed rules and regs that we have heard today, starting with the Kansas Department of Agriculture and KR 4-28-8. There were a lot of comments. Uh, just wanted to know if anyone wanted those comments recorded in the uh, report. Yes, Representative Penn. Madam, I don't, Madam Chair, I don't know if uh, any of the comments that we had just now in that robust discussion were captured. If they were, I would like for those to be recorded, please. Thank you. We're going to go stick with the Department of Agriculture um, at first. So. Yeah, it's been a long uh, week. Yeah. Long, long week. Uh, Senator Tyson, I think, uh, has some comments. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, mean, I, I just would um, hope that we would capture that they proceed with caution and make sure that they are not impacting in a negative way, um, regardless what Representative Carmichael said about us not caring. We absolutely do care as to what goes on with these inspections, and we do want safe environment and safe food. But there is always a um, a balance too, not with the safety, but with the overregulation, and we just want to make sure that we're not overregulating these businesses to the point of strangling them, while recognizing the need for safe food and safe environments. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you. Question for research: Do you want to? Um, synthesize that down into what you're going to put into the report for the committee to approve, or would you like to do that offline? And next time we meet, have the committee, we, we have to approve the report either way, but do you want to take a stab at that now or in the draft of the report? I'd like to mull that over, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, and, and um, of course, we'd run it past you and uh, the Vice uh, Chairperson Warren. Sorry. Sure. Appreciate that. There were also some um, concerns about, or we had questions that we wanted to be answered. I hope those got captured. I think they included um, what is the amount of funds that um, is tied to this regulation. Um, there was a question about why we have an inspector at all. I don't know if that's a question we want to be included in the report. 
And uh, I had a question about which industries, which stakeholders, who gave input on the proposed regulation? Have we captured all the questions or comments regarding the Department of Ag? Madam Senator Chair, Francisco. Representative Michael. Oh, I'm sorry. Sure. Uh, Representative, hold on. We'll get to Senator Francisco. And I then understand. You. Thank mm -hmm. you. Madam Vice Chair, I, when, we, when you made the comment about our inspections needed at all, um, I think we want to make it clear that I think those were the inspections on meat processing. And um, it may help for the committee to understand um, why we have state inspections and federal inspections, depending on a choice someone makes. But I just wanted to clarify that, that wasn't inspections, that was meat inspections. Thank you. Yes. And why have state inspections as well as federal inspections, I think was more the gist of the questions, or maybe we don't want the question um, posed at all. But. And I think actually, um, as I was listening to the question being asked uh, while we were having the hearing, it seemed more like a rhetorical question, uh, why the duplication? And I'm not sure it's something that... Um, the agency would be able to answer, but I don't think there's any harm in posing the question and they're free to respond. It's not in their purview to reply. Have I captured the question correctly? Why do we have state inspections if we also have federal inspections of meat um, processing plants? I think I've captured the question correctly. That, Senator that was Senator Tyson's question. Yes. Was... Senator Tyson, do you want the question asked? Um, of the agency um, in the actually, report actually that, that would be great i know it's that they're doing a food report and and we could clarify that we understand that that it's a different inspection agency but it's um and they're going to say because we passed statute that makes right. it the state inspection greater Quiet. than or equal to the federal yes and they did that for money but yeah it would be great to see how the agency responds thank you madam chairman Okay, so unless there's objection, we'll go ahead and include that question in the report. Representative Carmichael. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I appreciate the difficulty that our staff has in sometimes reducing our extemporaneous remarks to a written report. And I do appreciate Ms. Shelley's willingness to attempt to do that. But I, she mentioned that she would provide that information in advance to the chair and the vice chair. And, and absent objection, I would appreciate the courtesy that that also be provided to the ranking member in advance of publication of the final report. I don't have objection to that. Thank you. Um, other comments on the Department of Agriculture regulation? Seeing none, then the Kansas State Board of Healing Arts and KAR 100-15-1 expiration dates for um, physician resident active license. Seeing none, then uh, what about Kansas Department of Health and Environment Division of Healthcare Finance KAR 129-6-88 disabled individuals with earned income determined eligibles? There was a lot of discussion. I'm not um sure what we want to reduce to comments for the report. Does anyone want to take a try at it? Senator Francisco. Um, thank you, Madam Je Vice Chair. Um, the committee, I, I would start by saying um, the committee um, appreciates the presentation of an initiative or a um, opportunity to try to balance um, the um, opportunity for um, Medicaid um, subsidies or Medicaid insurance um, with the um, regulation or with the change that the legislature um, passed to modify the protected income and understand there is a balance between the two. Um, the committee is concerned that because of the 
um, possible cost or revenue um, impact that um, such a change um, might better be proposed to in statute or to the legislature rather than through regulations. Uh, yeah, pretty well done. <laughs> um, yeah. Any objections um, to the uh, statement proposed by Senator Francisco? I think it uh, nicely encapsulates the discussion that we had today. Thank you for that. Committee, are there other comments or discussion on the KDHE regulation? Madam Senator Chair. Francisco? Not just that I would appreciate um, any um, enhancement or editing that our research department might have. Yes, Representative Carmichael with a comment. Um, on further reflection, I think it's best we leave it right where Senator Francisco left it. I think that's a good compromise, and I don't need to add my additional remarks, which are already on the YouTube video for anybody who cares. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you for keeping us as brief as possible. Uh, committee, any other comments or discussion? All right, then we do have um, the comments and discussion proposed for the report. Is there any other business to come before the committee today? I don't have any on the agenda, but thank you committee for your time and attention today. And thank you to our conferees for appearing as well and the work you did ahead of time and to our staff uh, for the work you do as well for the committee in Kansas. So I want to thank everyone, wish everyone um, a good weekend, and we are adjourned. Mm -hmm.